Well, one thing I did send you, thinking you may enjoy it, is it had just popped up. I had never seen it. I don't think anyone else had, except for people saw it during the original airing. An edition of Southeastern Championship Wrestling from late July 1978. Yes, and, and uh, uh, my old friend Joe Dombrowski is working with Les Thatcher on some projects, and uh, they have dug up a couple of these things, I guess. And this, uh, you tweeted it out, and 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 I retweeted it and also got a chance. I, it was just this morning. I haven't watched all of it yet, but I did watch uh, the match I was most interested in, and then just a couple of, of pieces of it from there. But this would, now that we've started talking about it and realize what date and et cetera, it was, and the, the matches that are being promoted and et cetera, this TV show was the week before the <clears throat> WFIA, the wrestling fans, international association convention in Knoxville, the first week of August, I guess, or, or it was the last week of July, whatever it was. I got the fucking program in the other room. I didn't think to pick it up. But anyway, this was the week before the summertime convention of the WFIA where all the wrestling fans from around the country that were somewhat smart, and even all of them weren't. Eloise Mascoro was not smart from Dallas, but she loved the Von Erich. She loved wrestling, so she she got started with it. But anyway... There'd be about 50 or 60 or 70. This is this was probably the 75% of the pool of smart fans in the country back then, right? That would have this convention. And we went to Knoxville in 78. That's the first one I went to. It's where I met Les Thatcher and Ron Fuller and some of these guys. And um, so this was the TV that was the week beforehand where Ronnie Garvin and Boris Malenko were promoting their Russian chain match. Uh, I, one of the most, I would say most famous, but one of my favorite wrestling pictures that I ever took. And actually it's been in a number of magazines and places was, uh, the Mongolian stomper who Malenko managed and coordinated ran in and, and uh, while a referee was down and Garvin is literally, we thought he was going to bleed out. He was just bleeding. It was ridiculous amounts of blood. Uh, he's bleeding and the stomper is standing over him and he's trying to take the Russian chain off his wrist. And and I took that picture. as one of my favorite ones. There's an eight by 10 of it hanging up over my, uh, my uh, front office window here, as a matter of fact. But anyway, the reason why I was interested in this show was because anytime that there's a Phil Higgerson and Dennis Condry match that I haven't seen or that exists on tape because there's so few of them, I got to watch it, right? And it, it, it just, I mean, I know how good Dennis was, but it gave me, once again, a further appreciation of Phil Higgerson as just be the, as Jerry Jarrett would say, the epitome of professional wrestling. Um, A big fucking tough redneck fuck from Jackson, Tennessee, who could work his ass off and moved like crazy for his body and cut a believable promo because he was just him talking. And he and Dennis were my favorite heel tag team before the Midnight Express. And they had a, a five solid year period where they just rotated between the three Tennessee territories. <clears throat> Jerry Jarrett was running the Memphis end, which included Louisville and Evansville and Lexington. Goulas was running the Nashville end, which still, when they started, included Birmingham and Chattanooga. And Ron Fuller was running Southeastern and Knoxville and the Tri-Cities. And you could work full-time in each territory. So they would go from being the main event heel team in one. When their run was up, they'd just bop over to one of the others, and they rotated because they were so good you never got tired of them. And they had a record-setting run against Fargo for Goulas in, what, 76? Oh, good Lord. Yeah, when they um, – Rough House would come home or or, or come over to uh, Tennessee from to visit Jackie for a couple weeks at Christmas back in those days. <clears throat> and so they did a deal with Condry and Higgerson and the Fargo brothers and good Lord. Um, definitely Birmingham was huge. Chattanooga, I think sold out. They drew big in Nashville. We got a couple of the matches up here in Louisville and they were, they were doing 5,000 people in Louisville um, for a couple weeks in a row to see, you know, the Fargo's reunite, but it was the deal where Hickerson hard Fargo on TV the story is in 
my book Tuesday Night at the Gardens, which is flying off the shelves if anyone's interested at that, at that same website we don't talk about. But Fargo knew that Rough House was coming in, and there were, as as hard as it may be now for people to understand, there were still a couple of different circuits in the Goulas territory before Jerry Jarrett split off. And this is going to be a little history lesson, but what the fuck? You got to understand it. The territory was so big, they had regular weekly towns like Birmingham and Memphis ran on Monday nights. So they had to have different talent. And they had four or five still at the time live studio wrestling television programs. Chattanooga had a live studio show. Uh, Memphis had a live studio show. Birmingham had a live studio show. There was even, there was one for a while in Huntsville, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> so to maximize revenue for their holiday two weeks before and during Christmas week, big shows with the Fargos, the Bounty Hunters and Jimmy Kent were a heel team in part of the territory. And Higgerson and Condry were a heel team in another part of the territory. <laughs> and Fargo did a deal where he had Phil Higgerson work with him. I, and goddamn, I can't remember the locations off the top of my head. This is where you need Scott Teal. But it was like fucking Chattanooga TV that afternoon. He had he worked with Phil Higgerson and had Higgerson hardway him punched him in the fucking face several times for real so that he could bust his fucking eye. And of course, Higgerson knew what he was doing as far as trying to bust somebody's eyebrow open and trying to close somebody's eye up because your cheek is swollen up. But anyway, boom. And the people in the studio, I saw this fucking tape. It aired up here in Louisville and the people were shitting themselves and they're screaming because they can tell he punched him right in the face and it sounded like that in person, right? And Fargo's trying to fight back, but he's gigged and then he's busted open, you know, hard way and blah, blah, blah. And it was a heavy fucking angle that they did and they and finally he and Condry beat Fargo just all the way down and he got saved and everything by the baby faces and he got up and he swore with his... In the closing segment of the show was... With Harry Thornton, the announcer, there's Fargo where you can tell his head's busted open and his eyes swelling shut, and he's looking right in the camera, swearing that Higgerson and Condry are going to be fucking done after he calls his brother Roughhouse, right? And then that night in like the the Huntsville, Alabama television was was after the late news, Central Time, so like 10.30, that was when the live studio show was down there. Down there, the bounty hunters and Jimmy Kent are beating up fucking some job guy team, and nobody knows why Jackie Fargo hasn't showed up. And then Fargo runs into the goddamn studio with his fucking clothes ripped up and throws his suitcase aside and hits the rig and makes a big comeback on the fucking bounty hunters. And then cuts a promo saying that they ran him off the road <laughs> earlier that evening on his way to the fucking studio. And look at what they did to my face. <laughs> and that TV aired in places and they had the Fargos come back and get even against the bounty hunters and Higgerson and Condry for three solid weeks in every town in the territory, depending on what TV show aired where and goddamn uh, made two angles off the same hard way. And nobody in the different towns ever knew the fucking difference. Scott Teal told me that Hickerson and Condry versus Jackie Fargo was the hottest program he remembered for all those years that he was with Nick Goulas. Yeah, because it, it, Scott came in to, he came from Florida after he got out of college. He moved up to Nashville, and I'm going to say he got to Nashville in probably late 72, early 73, or elsewise he would have seen Jackie Fargo and Al Green. But except for Jackie Fargo and Al Green, <laughs> that was <laughs> Fargo and Hickerson. Well, not only that, just everybody with Hickerson and Condry as a tag team, they were so good because they were, they looked completely different and they looked like completely different people. But at the same time, you could tell that they kind of, they had a chemistry with each other and they got along. It's sort of like Laurel and Hardy didn't look anything like each other, but there, there was a contrast, but you could tell they, they fit together. There was a chemistry. Um, and I'm not trying to say they were fucking comedians, although the fucking, 
the Tennessee bullshit Gaga with Higgerson and Condry was fucking flawless, and it worked every time because they never winked at anybody. They always fucking it was it, it always looked when they fucked up and did the fucking Gaga stuff where they had double knockouts. It always looked like an accident. It always looked like they were a surprise. It was they did something every night. It was like the first time that anything like that had ever happened to them. Their facials were tremendous by their body language. Dennis learned a lot of his body language from Higgerson. It, Hickerson was a main event guy pretty much from the time that he broke in in Tennessee because he early on he was he was such a big powerful looking guy for the time didn't have a muscle on his body as we'll get to in a minute but um he was easily 270 pounds and and just fucking his hands were just thick and his fists and he just ugly fucking bulldog face he was a redneck from Jackson and he could talk believably because every fucking redneck from Jackson can brag about fucking kicking your ass and call you names, right? As part of being a redneck from Jackson. There are none now, I guess. They're not on television at least. But you believed he, he looked like a fucking guy that would get out of a fucking truck and beat the piss out of you with a fucking stick. And he could, he was a natural worker. And when Al Green was having... What was going to be his last run turned out to be kind of his next to last run as a wrestler, as a top heel. Um, and his brother Don was working full time for Goulas as a single. He they put Hickerson together with Al Green, who taught him all kinds of old fucking tag team heel heat bullshit. But then Hickerson moved. He could fucking come off the top, flying leg drops off the top. He took back drops. If you threw him over the top rope, he did a battle royal finish one time. Never seen anything like it. Where the baby face threw him over the top rope, and as soon as he went over, the baby face turned his back, and Hickerson held on and swung back around and came back in over the top rope all in one motion. This big, fat, six foot one, maybe 270 pound fucking redneck with a, a belly twice as big as his chest, and he could just do that shit. And all of his shit looked legitimate because he didn't try to get too fancy and he just a lot of times he just punched and broad armed people in the fucking head uh but it worked and and he and and dennis got a ton of heat and i've uh, you know i've mentioned before the you know the uh the rib that uh, dennis played on phil one time for tojo yamamoto but the fucking what they did in the ring was this is the mid seventies, right? It wouldn't play today, but God, it was classic. It's the mid seventies in Tennessee and Alabama and fucking Mississippi, right? Wherever. So they bleached their hair blonde. And in 1976, they teamed up in 75. They bleached their hair blonde. And the first thing they do in 76 is they both start wearing red, white, and blue outfits. And Phil calls himself the spirit of 76 and the bicentennial Kings, right? And they're wearing all this fucking sequin shit. And then they went to where Phil had the imprint of a fucking set of lips on the ass of his trunks, right? And Dennis had some wild ass shit on his trunks and they do the old heel spot where every time the fucking baby face came out on top and bumped him around, they'd go to the corner and hug each other. And of course, now everybody thinks they're gay. Well, God, Phil Higgerson looks the furthest thing from fucking from a any homosexual human being I've ever seen in my life. And fucking Dennis with the bright blonde hair, you know, may have been different, but they fucking milked that for all it was worth to the point where some of the boys even like, holy shit. And it was just classic heel heat. And then then when they'd have people ready to fucking knife them. Then the baby face would make a big fucking comeback and they would bump everywhere. But they were just, it, they were always an exciting team to watch and their, their shit always looked good. The body language was excellent and they were just classic heel tag team of the time. And I feel when they fucking worked with Tojo, his favorite thing to call Tojo, I guess you couldn't do that today. You, you bullet headed Jap. You bullet-headed Jap, but we're going to play a section of this, this promo that they did in a second. But everybody that was watching these TV shows, and since there were only three channels in every town, everybody was. The wrestling show had a fucking 30 or 40 fucking share in every goddamn market. 
everybody, this is why this worked because everybody in the world that was watching knew somebody like that, whether it was their uncle, their grandfather, the asshole that worked at the goddamn gas station. Um, everybody knew some fucking asshole like that sounded and looked like Phil Higgerson, and they hated it when he beat up the fucking guys that they liked and called them names and et cetera, et cetera. And it was that fucking simple, but it worked. And then the guy just had to back it up. And, but you've got the interview from this show from Knoxville we were talking about in 78, right? With Ron Wright was managing. But, and to add fucking superstar name to the mix, Ron Wright's managing Higgerson and Condry as the top heel team in, in Knoxville, right? That's right. Let's play this right now. It's set up by Phil Rainey, who was the co-host to Les Thatcher on Southeastern Championship Wrestling. Let's hear this. Against Rip Smith, also in the Southeastern title match, the Mongolian Stopper, managed by Don Carson, takes on Robert Fuller. And in the special chain match, a Russian chain match, Boris Malenko beats Ronnie Garvin. And also a Southeastern tag title match, the champions, Dennis Condry and Phil Hickerson, presented by Ron Wright, meets Jimmy Golden and Bob Roop, and that tandem managed by Bill Golden. Now let's hear from Ron Wright. Let me tell you something, you know, it's a crying shame. We took these titles and we've defended against them two idiots uh, 10, 15, maybe 20 times. We've beat them every time. And why the Southeastern organization wait, Ron, comes up and Ron, forces wait, my wait, men. Wait, wait a minute. I've told you a thousand times that you're talking way over these people's head up there in Hazard, Kentucky. This man is a smart man. He's been in every kind of institution all the way across the country. Let me tell you something. Bill Golan, you dog. And that's exactly what you is, is a dog. I hope that you are there in Hazard. I want you to go out there and I want you to manage them boys because you're going to be so humiliated. We're going to humiliate you so bad, we're going to do it through your boy. We're going to beat him and we're going to beat his brains out. After we're through, we're going to stick his toes in his ears, baby, and you're in a hell of a position when you get that happen. Bill Golden, you come out there and if you make one move, baby, I'm going to put my fist right upside your head. And if you go down, I'm going to put the bonic leg right across your neck. And they're going to tote you out, Bill Golan. You're a dog. Your family is a bunch of dogs. Oh, what more can I say? He said enough, and that's the way it ought to be. But we're going to defend them titles and hang on to them, I assure you. Well, there it is, Jim. Phil Hickerson. <laughs> your dog. Your family's dogs. I'll tell you what. When you get your toes stuck in your ears, you're in a hell of a position. Oh, goddamn. Nobody had to write that. Right. And everybody said that fucking asshole. I'd like to goddamn. But anyway, because it you was... watch it, too. And he, and and obviously this is one of the problems with modern wrestling. But he looks like he believes it. He looks like yes. he's telling the truth. He looks like he's being honest about what he wants to do. He doesn't look like someone who's been given words to say. He doesn't look like someone pretending to be someone he's not. He doesn't look like someone playing a role. He looks and sounds like someone who means what he's going to say. And that's what got people into the doors in Hazard, Kentucky for that match. Oh my God. And, and everybody's all oh, in Hazard, Kentucky. Hazard, Kentucky in the Southeastern days would do because I've been to the building. It just, it didn't do as well in Smoky Mountain as it did back in the fucking seventies and early eighties. You could do fucking three or 4,000 people in Hazard, Kentucky. And they would come out for that shit and they would attempt to knife those guys. Um, but nobody did a fucking burning hammer Phoenix 450 fucking one wing tooth fairy splash. Anyway, uh, but so you you tweeted that and I got to go back and watch the whole show because there's a bunch of other good stuff on it. And and thanks, Les and Joe Dombrowski for finding this stuff and everybody should find them. But anyway, um that brought up then something who do you remember who tweeted the Higgerson Helwig confrontation? No, I actually didn't see okay. the tweet where you didn't see this. Okay. Well, after that, somebody had tweeted that to me. I've wow. And I've retweeted a couple things. If you don't follow me on Twitter and if you're, if you're a Republican, don't bother. Cause you get blocked as soon as you out yourself. But if you are a sane, rational human being who likes old, old time wrestling and, and, uh, uh basically wants to follow me, uh, you get to see some of this stuff at the Jim Cornette. But anyway, somebody tweeted the thing with Higgerson and Elwig where they said Higgerson's best line ever. And it was, it, it was, it was one of them was when he came out and he told Jim Helwig and Steve Borden on Memphis TV, when they had been in the business 15 minutes, the only thing you guys are better at me than doing is sticking needles up your butt with steroids or however he phrased it. Um, 
but here's the setup for this. What had gone on before this? If, that Rick Bassman idiot out in California had sent pictures of the, he had gone to, as everyone knows now that's seen the sting or the warrior documentaries, he'd gone to gyms in Southern California and found a bunch of bodybuilders. I think he had four of them originally. And he had attempted to train him for professional wrestling who he was to be able to train people. I have no idea. Cause he was never anybody to begin with. And, and the training showed, um, Two of them dropped out, but Jim Helwig and Steve Borden, later known as obviously the Ultimate Warrior and Sting, continued with it, and he sent their pictures to like every promoter in the world, and Jerry Jarrett is the one that bit. Because <laughs> they look fucking they looked like human cartoons. I mean, Helwig was way bigger than he ever was any any other time in his career. He had to be what, 320? He looked it was warlord size. Massive, yeah. And Sting was bigger than he'd ever been or would be again. And so Jerry Jared saw the pictures. He's like, well, you know, and, and they'll come cheap because who are they? They're nobody, right? So I had seen them either just before or just after this fucking deal they did with Higgerson took place. Because I in 1985, I've told this story, but it's a long time ago. We got a bunch of new listeners. 1985. I come home to Louisville for Christmas to visit my mom and everybody, obviously. And I was here on a Tuesday. And so I was going to go down to the gardens and say hello to Miss Jarrett and see some of the boys. And so I get there that night and, and I'm talking to Lawler and Dundee's there and Miss Jarrett's there and et cetera. I'm talking to everybody. That's why Tom Pritchard and Pat Rose were the heavily bodies being managed by Sherry Martell. Uh, till this time, uh, last time I'd seen Sherry before that, she broke her leg. This time, Tom broke his leg. I was the fucking cat of death amongst those people. And then during the matches, everybody flooded. The baby faces would watch the matches in the Louisville Gardens on the right-hand side where the baby faces came out, and the heels would watch the matches on the left-hand side where the heels came out. There was a back section blocked off where you could go sit down in the general admission and the people couldn't come to you. And I notice everybody's flooding out of the locker room and everybody's going outside. I'm like, what the fuck? It's Lawler and Dundee's match. And they're working with these two guys. I think they were, were the, the first name was the freedom fighters or was that the, the fucking, they were the blade runners, the freedom fighters, Borden and Hellwig in like six weeks, they were had three or two or three different names. But anyway, the match that night was Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee against Hellwig and Borden. And, and the curtains are both sold out. And I'm asking somebody, because I've seen these guys, and they're, they look like human cartoons. And I'm like, where did they come from? And they said, they came from California and watched this. Apparently, Jerry Jared had said, all right, let's see if we can. Maybe this was the last ditch effort. They'd already gone through a couple of things. They were only there a few weeks. But basically, he had told Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee to go 30 minutes Broadway with these guys. <laughs> and he said, let's see what the fuck my two magicians can do. It was the worst match I've ever seen either Jerry Lawler or Bill Dundee involved in. I don't know what the, f they did everything, tried to get everything that they, they could possibly think of to do with two guys who had never been in a ring before in about three times in that 30 minutes. And that was kind of like, I think, the evaluation. Because as I think about it, they came in the first week, um, I think, supposedly baby faces because they looked so good. But then they switched them heel. That's why they'd been working with Lawler and Dundee. And then they gave them for two weeks, Buddy Wayne was their manager because they couldn't talk either. And they sounded like two idiots. And then they were gone. But during this, they also tried to do something with uh phil higgerson and they were they were getting all their i guess jared was trying to get all their veterans because they knew buddy could talk so he, he as a manager okay he'd done that before he's got lawler in the ring with him he's got dundee in the ring with him he's got higgerson in the ring with him can anybody get anything out of these guys and the answer was no <laughs> And of course, as we all know, then Bill Watts bit because he figured maybe he could do something with them. And that's when he ran Helwig off saying, please get out of this business. But Sting stayed and actually learned and got better. 
But I've heard stories from the boys also that during this program, the ultimate warrior was just astonished and dumbfounded. Why in the world that he would have to sell for or put Phil Higgerson over because he's looking at Higgerson and seeing his physique and that he's an old guy not realizing that Phil Higgerson would have gotten out of his fucking truck and just beat the teetotal bejesus out of fucking Jim Helwig in a goddamn shoot in about 15 seconds. But he was offended that he was asked to sell for him. So in this angle that they do, you can't see it, obviously, because we're audio. But Higgerson makes a point of picking him up and giving him a full fucking scoop slam. <laughs> and then Helwig, did, did, if he did cooperate, it was minimal. He may just not have known how. But uh, everything that Phil does looks great. Everything that when Helwig was trying to throw forearms, he looked like he was trying to fuck a sheep. Um, it was just god awful. But this is the promo from Memphis TV that Higgerson cut on the, the Ultimate Warrior when they came face to face, and Higgerson knew exactly what he'd been saying about him behind his back. Guys, Phil Higgerson. Oh, well, it takes a little time, Jim. I mean, you know, you just this doesn't happen overnight. Well, we understand we're a little green and new to the area and stuff like that, but when you, when you take into account what we look like, our physiques and the, the rock-hard muscle that we're carrying, you know, that, that should uh, add up to some of the disadvantages compared to, you know, the fat people, the, uh, the king of all the fast food restaurants, Jerry Lawler and uh, Phil Hickerson. Spends his days. He never goes to the gym. Never seen the inside of a gym. Yeah, but he's held a lot of titles now. Let me make that difference right there. That Hickerson, and I have always agreed with him, but the son of a gun has been at it a long time, Jim. And you and Steve, I think, got to take that in. Uh, 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 I, I, I think they're probably in a hurry, Phil, and I got to say, man, I ain't got nothing against you, you know, and I've, since y'all been here, I've been trying to hit y'all, you know, I've been talking, I was like, you ain't got no right to come out here and say, hey, if you, I had not seen the inside of a gym, and I'm fat, and then, oh, I said, you don't have a little right to say that, let me tell you something, you know the reason why you had to wrestle against Lawler, and any, like Dundee, Mantell, myself, or Coco, the reason you two have not wrestled in them matches because you're green, and you don't know how to wrestle. The only thing that you know how to do, brother, is to pull them bitches down and put them steroids in that booty. That's the only thing that you do, idiots know, and you know it. You know, you know, this 22 inch charm, I'm going to put your head in there and smash it like a rotten tomato. Man, don't scare me one damn bit, brother, because the one thing about it, I can rap and I can fight, and that's something you that you can't do. You cannot do either one, and that's the reason why you're going to be stressing in the first and second matches the rest of your damn life. All right, Phil. I think, I think, I think they heard it out there. I think they got the point. You don't have no right to come out here and say anything about any money, Yeah, we do. We have a lot of rights. All the help and stuff that you can... That's right. Yeah, I'm telling you. That's right now, boy. Let's go. Let's go. And you heard those people screaming because Phil just said, fuck it. He's in his goddamn blue jeans and his fucking shirt. And he just pulls his fucking shirt tail out and starts and locks up with his big muscle head. And it, it goes south from there, obviously. But, um, but anyway, that, you know, th that's what everybody is missing is any kind of genuine emotion and any kind of genuine delivery and just being somebody that looks like who they're supposed to fucking be and acts like it. And, and, uh, anyway, Higgerson was, uh, it's the Phil Higgerson appreciation drive through, but he was, he was always one of my favorite guys to watch. Uh, uh, he made a great baby face. He switched baby face when he saved, Oh God damn it. It was, he saved Jimmy golden. I think from, uh, Barnes and Dundee, one day on studio wrestling when uh, they, for whatever reason they had established that all the baby faces or anybody else that could have helped were otherwise occupied or gone or whatever. And Higgerson hit the ring and fucking Barnes and Dundee bumped through the fucking roof for him. And he was a great fucking baby face. He just had fire and oomph and his shit looked right. And, uh, he had to take a break. He and Dennis broke up in 79 cause he had a couple of a bad knee injury and something else. And he took a few years off and came back and worked Memphis th during this time period, 84, 85, 86. And I remember, 
<laughs> one of the great American Bass shows where we co-promoted uh, for, with Crockett and came to Memphis and worked with Jarrett. We're standing in the back. They're using Phil as a baby face. And now because, once again, everybody knew somebody like him down there. So when the fuck, when he was a baby face, for whatever reason, the black people in Memphis loved him. So he was wearing a goddamn tuxedo jacket with tails and fucking coming to the ring to fucking party train by the Gap Band. And it worked, and he was the fucking... Phil Higgerson from Jackson, Tennessee, with that fucking face was the hottest, you know, fucking baby face for the black audience, right? And Tully Blanchard was standing back there going, what the fuck is this? Because he's never seen Phil. I said, that's Phil Higgerson. I said, man, he's just, you know, he's always worked around here, but he's fucking great. I said, he and Dennis Condry were the best heel team I ever saw before the Midnight Express. He said, you never saw me and Gino. I said, yes, I did. (laughs) <laughs> which may be why Tully didn't like me so much. But anyway, um, but yeah, so that was that. 